forward. It does. Okay. So my name is David Keeter, and I'm from the University of California, Irvine. Um, and I'd like to thank the uh, program committee for selecting our abstract for this oral presentation. Uh, this is certainly a um, collaborative effort of a bunch of people who are not paid for this work but are doing it out of their own charity because it, it, it makes a difference in the field or we hope that it will make a difference in the field. And it's been supported by INCF in terms of uh, providing meetings where we can get together face to face and uh, discuss uh, this work. And that's why I wear an INCF shirt here today to show my appreciation. So uh, as all of you probably know that are in the field of neuroimaging, and for those of you who don't know, there's been a, a large proliferation of available neuroimaging data and tools over the last 10 years. Um, you, know, uh, you know, 10 years ago we were saying, hey, look, we need, we need large data sets to be freely available for the public to share. And now we have a lot of data and even more coming online all the time. But what we're really missing is the ability, uh, this should be in front of that, but we're not going to worry about that right now. But what we're really missing is the ability to do, uh, to reproduce uh, results and replicate results. And uh, so we have some um, uh, imaging formats, and those imaging formats are good at, fairly good at representing binary data. But what we lack is uh, formats for the metadata, all the extra stuff that you need to know about an experiment a workflow, provenance, what you did to the data, there we go, oh no, and so forth. So, uh, hey, all right, so um, some of the goals uh, uh, for us are uh, comprehensive data sharing, uh, enhancing reproducibility and reusability of the existing data, uh, being able to discover and access data where it is um, to enable new research. and. Uh, our problem right now is that we have no common standard for the metadata. So, you know, how do you, when you get uh, a bunch of data sets, sometimes you get them where they're organized in different directory structures, which makes them hard to use. And I'm, uh, you'll hear some later speaker uh, talk about uh, some solutions for that. But also, like, how do you know what experiment uh, the subject came from, who the PI was? I mean, where is all that information? Um, for for provenance pipelines, how do you know what was run in what order, what the parameters were, and so forth? And uh, sometimes they come in the form of text files and log files, but we think we can do something better than that, something that's more um, uh, relevant to today's semantic technologies, and that is both extensible and yet uh, uh, descriptive. And so uh, the neuroimaging data modeling uh, working group, dang it, there we go. Neuroimaging data model uh, data modeling uh, working group is a, a subgroup of the uh, neuroimaging and data sharing task force, part of the INCF. And what this working group does is focus on uh, metadata standards for uh, uh, neuroimaging. And so what we've done is we've built um, NIDM off of uh, available semantic web technologies uh, such as RDF and uh, query technology Sparkle. Uh, built on top of PROV, which is a family of specifications for provenance that uh, is basically uh, composed of entities, uh, activities, and agents, these three objects, in a series of fixed relationships. And so building upon, on top of that, we start to develop um, object models, is what we call them, to describe experimental metadata, workflow metadata, and uh, in, uh, what we've done right now is mass univariate statistical results uh, within this framework. We, we put together these object models. We iterate with a uh, field of international collaborators. Every Monday, we have a, um, a, a conference call, a video call. Um, with people from, uh, that are involved in this from around the world, and we come up with object models and we test them out. And uh, the key here is that once we have an object model that we like, we uh, will write tools or help the tool developers themselves that create software packages, such as SPM and FSL, for example, uh, incorporate these, these things into their software so that for you as the user, uh, the hope is that you don't really have to do much to be able to use these technologies and you get the um, expressiveness uh, that comes with them. So let's just take an example uh, really quick of, a, of the process kind of we would go through to use something like this. So the idea is you take, and here I've got just an Excel spreadsheet or any kind of tabular data. The columns are variables, the rows are subjects. So what we're going to do is we're going to model the variables and how they relate to one another with what we call an object model. And we're going to use entities, activities, agents, and some fixed sets of relations that come with a provenance uh, data model. So we create this little object model is what we call it, a graph of how our variables relate to one another and how they relate to um, the subjects contained therein. 
uh, what attributes we think are important to describe uh, these variables or these objects. And the way we construct the way we construct these attributes is in the same form as RDF, where you have uh, a namespace and a colon and then a term. And that um, that if you were to dereference, if you were to go to the namespace, which is just a URL on the web, and you were you would be able to look up the term. This is the uh, the idea that you could look up the term and you could find out what it exactly means. So it's hard to read, but one of them says uh, heart rate, uh, NCIT uh, heart rate, something like that, because I can't see from right here. Um, and that's the NCIT thesaurus, National Cancer Institute. So if you went to the National Cancer Institute thesaurus, you could look up heart rate average, something like that is what it says, or time point. Time point's a good one. You could look up time point, and that thesaurus would give you a definition of time point. And that's what I mean when you see a data file that comes to you with this form, uh, and you see time point, you can look up the definition. And so there's somewhat semantically annotated and self-documenting. So in 10 years, if you receive this CSV file, you might not remember what these variables uh, mean. But in 10 years, if you receive this, this file, you can, the hope is that the terminologies persist, and that's an important bit here, that you could look up these definitions and know exactly what someone meant when they wrote this by time point in this example. And so since these are graphs, they're, they're, the, the object model is a graph. We take this data, parse it, put it into a graph. We serialize it into a text-based format. In this case, it's called Turtle, but you could use a variety of formats here. And then you have databases that are graph-based databases. And uh, much like relational databases, uh, instead of doing SQL queries on a database, you can do Sparkle queries on these graphs. And you can, this is just an example from the Connie Center where you can build web applications, much like you did for uh, relational databases using these backends. Um, the benefit here is you're using semantic technologies and you're providing semantics for your data. And uh, if you use terms that exist in terminologies, proper terminologies that are being integrated with ontologies, you've now linked your data sets by the use of these terms to potentially millions of other data items that are out there on the web. So uh, the NIDM experiment model is one of the models that we're currently working on. And this is, again, to describe experiments. And so you have a whole block of um, entities, uh, agents, and activities that describe investigations, so uh, the minimal set of data that you need to describe an investigation. Uh, because uh, this is based on semantic technologies, you can continue to add attributes to these uh, various objects that may be appropriate for uh, your experiments, and you're not going to break any queries. We, um, so it's extensible in that sense. So there's a minimal set of things that you know we think are important for you to describe an experiment. And then you could add to your heart's content additional attributes, and you won't break existing Sparkle queries. So then there's uh, session levels and series levels. There are collections that bind things together, like anatomical scans and functional scans. And we're currently working on this object model and testing it out. So. Um, if you uh, have any suggestions, you're free to, um, you know, join the, the working group or, or contribute. And there will be some links at the end where you can uh, get involved. One minute. Cool. All right. So workflows. So we have an object model for workflows. And in a similar set, it uses a activities, agents, and um, uh, entities, and same RDF. And what we're doing is we're describing workflows in this case. And again, you create a model that describes your workflow. What happened to the data? What were the parameters? What order did things happen? You serialize that into this RDF uh, uh, format, and you've captured uh, provenance about what happened with your data. Nightpipe, for instance, in Python already supports this and will output it. Um, you know, like I said, SPM supports it uh, right now, but we're, we're working on incorporating it into the other tools. Um, Mass univariate statistical results. We have an object model for that. In this case, what's depicted here is uh, entities and activities and things that differ between the SPM software and the FSL software. Pretty interesting if you're combining uh, uh, mass univariate results from both these software tools into a meta-analysis. Uh, before you have a picture like this, it's unclear to you what's different about these two software packages. Uh, so we have an object model. Again, we've worked with the SPM software developers. SPM 12 will allow you to export uh, your uh, univariate results into this object model, and then you can build tools on top of it, or you can use Sparkle to query it. And uh, uh, the next slide. Okay, and one of the important parts is terms here, and so you need to make sure your terms are defined in terminologies, uh, and where you need to add new terms to terminologies, 
Um, you, uh, we have highlighted here Neuralex in red because Neuralex has been particularly good at uh, helping us get terms into their terminology with uh, a minimal uh, amount of overhead and uh, they allow you to iterate on the definitions of terms and things like that. So important bit here is to pick namespaces and terms that you know are going to persist because if the term definitions are gone in three years then uh, all of a sudden you have a, a file that's not semantically meaningful. And so we put into Neuralex a DICOM terminology. All the DICOM tags are defined in Neuralex. So if you need terms for DICOM uh, tags, they're there in Neuralex. Uh, here are the uh, list of resources. All our code is on GitHub. It's on the web. We have our specifications that we post here on the NIDM website. We also have an IDM primer there where we have a template for specifications. So if you create an object model for your local uh, site that you think is interesting for your local site, you can download our, temp our templates and make yourself a W3C style specification that describes your object model. And uh, the hope is that you would contribute that. But if you don't, at least you have something that's well defined and uh, specified according to something that looks like a W3C style spec. These are a list of the contributors. I apologize. There are affiliations that are wrong because people move around. There are people that are missing. Sorry, Samir. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a long list of people, and uh, so that's it. Thank you. So we will continue.